webinar will begin shortly. Into the webinar. The 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 webinar will begin shortly. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. My name is Kevin Gaunt, and I shall be the moderator for the webinar. 
The webinar is entitled Using Data to Optimize the Operation and Maintenance of Wastewater Networks from Collection to Treatment and will be presented by Ruth Clark from Xylem. Now, unfortunately, due to some IT issues, Ruth can't join us to deliver the presentation, but we have a recorded copy that I'll be uh, running very shortly. Uh, what that does mean is that we don't have the opportunity for asking Ruth any questions that might arise from the, the presentation, uh, but there will be details later on uh, in the presentation of how you can contact Ruth and uh, she'll be more than happy to take any questions uh, after the event. So I'll now uh, hand over to Ruth um, and um, we'll listen to her presentation. Hello, I'm Ruth Clark and I work for Silent Water Solutions in the UK um, and I work in the area of digital solutions. So that means that I basically use data to try and solve problems um, faced by the water industry. Um, today I'm going to talk about using data uh, in the context of, of sewers, sewer networks and, and wastewater treatment. But before I do that, I just wanted to touch on some of the overarching challenges faced by the industry. So when I started to think about what I wanted to talk about during this presentation, looking at the interesting things I'm involved at, involved with, sorry, at work at present, it really struck me just how complex problems are that need to be managed by those who look after our sewer networks. And they were just the ones that sprung to mind immediately. So really, that was just the tip of the iceberg. Um, I put some of them on this slide. Um, and, and I guess my, my, my thought process with this was that in an ideal world, um, the, the approach to these problems wouldn't be to deal with each one in isolation, but to, to take a step back and look at the interconnectivity of all the issues um, that are faced and develop a roadmap of how these problems could be solved uh, holistically. Um, and I know that uh, most of the utilities do are doing that, um, but we also know that sometimes issues develop that have such criticality that, that the challenge has to be dealt with immediately. Um, and there's no time to see how uh, the solution could be expanded to help with other issues in the future. So this is something that I'm really personally quite interested in exploring and, and, and working in because there's such an interconnectivity between a lot of the, the discussions that I have with, um, with various parts of the utility businesses. Um, when you look at these problems um, and then you start to combine them with the sort of uncertainties of climate change, um, increased regu regulatory pressure, uh, budgets, etc, etc, it, it really it does make you appreciate the problems that are, uh, are being faced by those working in the water industry. Um, so, you know, there's lots of tools out there um, that can, can solve a lot of these problems um, in isolation, although sometimes they are obviously combined. So, you know, looking at energy consumption, um, this can you know, be looking at, at using smart pumps that, uh, that can, can make sure that they're running at the optimum uh, frequency and are constantly checking that. So often the, the optimum frequency isn't the design frequency. Um, so being able to do that, that obviously helps reduce energy costs that are, that are consumed by pumps. Um, there's staying with pumps, there's the ability to, to send back information on current voltage, temperature, vibration, etc. And use this information to, to look at asset health um, and combine all of this information in, in some form of uh, asset management platform that can, can help um, allow for more proactive maintenance and replacement strategies. So not just looking at every pump in isolation, but, but having a much more um, high level um, platform of looking at that. You can then start to bring in information about inline pipe inspection. So these aren't just looking for, for, for leaky pipes or for, um, you know, where you've got thinning uh, wall thickness or you've got um, wire breaks on precast concrete uh, pipes, but, but also looking for, for gas pockets. Uh, and that brings in, you know, the sort of maintenance and checking of air valves. Um, gas pockets don't only, um, or are not only associated with corrosion within rising means, but, but they also lead to much less efficient pumping. Um, if you start to look at, uh, 
you know, being able to detect infiltration and inflows into into networks um, shouldn't be there, um, leading to, to utilities treating water that they really shouldn't be. Um, or looking at, at the data signatures of, of blockages, um, or you know, which could be caused by sediment or fog, or indeed sewer collapses. Um, all of these have data signatures that can be picked up. Now, obviously, I can't talk about all of these things in the sort of 25 minutes I have to, to talk. Um, so I've, I've settled on on looking at um, CSO spills, um, and the reason I've settled on on talking about that is it's really just a, a sort of the, the high profile um, sort of news stories about it at the moment. We've had the, the BBC Panorama programme, we've got um, Philip Dunn MP tabling private members bill, we've got the, the River Wharf in Ilkley become the UK's first inland bathing water. Uh, so there's quite a lot of focus around this at the moment and a lot of it uh, negative, um, I should say. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about how we can possibly use data to, to help reduce CSO spills. Um, and then I'm going to move on to look at um, treatment in a, in a little bit of detail. So the approach I'm going to talk about now is, as I said, using real-time data to operate networks more efficiently um, by trying to use existing storage within the within the network um, to reduce the likelihood of spills, but also to enable utilities to not have to build their way out of trouble. So. Understanding the network, from my perspective, is, is the first is the place to start. Um, so, looking at what data is available, identifying any gaps, what information would help you understand the the network and be able to operate the network better. Um, so, useful information is historic data that's been collected throughout the network, such as level and flow. If there's rainfall information, um, be that uh, you know radar rainfall that might be provided to the utility for another reason or, or rain gauge data. Um, if the utility has calibrated hydraulic models um, and if, the, if they have information about incidents, so that could be, you know, uh, it could be CSO spills that have happened in the past, it could be internal external flooding incidents, it could be um, pump failures. Uh, all of this information can be brought together to give you a much better understanding of the network. Um, also being able to understand um, whether the network is suitable um, to be operated in a way to make use of additional storage or is it actually operating continually at full capacity um, in which case the approach i'm going to talk about now wouldn't really be relevant um, are there any assets within the network which have plcs that can be used to to operate the network in real time so they could be pumps it could be gates it could be pen stops um, can the rules that, uh, that operate these movable assets be rewritten in a way that allows the network to automatically be operated? Um, these are the questions that need to be asked at the outset of such a project. Um, and then you can start to use this data to train models such as artificial neural networks to, to help provide predictions of flows and depths at various locations in the network. Um, um, so you could look at the predict the flow of location based on rainfall in the catchment. Um, and that can be used in conjunction, for example, with a hydraulic model to look at the operation of a network um, in a particular location. So rather than using a, a huge network model of 50,000 nodes, you could cut that down to a particular area of interest and supplement it um, with the results of artificial neural networks, which could improve um, some of the assumptions uh, made to, to derive that model. So a lot of the, the things that are, are based on assumptions of the hydrology. So looking at the um, percentage impermeable area, um, you know, the, the what type of antecedent conditions are being used, all that kind of stuff can be uh, stripped out of, of models and replaced by artificial neural networks if appropriate. Um, so hydraulic models don't have to be used in these approaches, but they can be very useful to provide information about locations where there aren't any sensors. So you can't put a sensor everywhere in the in the network. And if you want to know what what might be happening in a location where there isn't a sensor, a hydraulic model can be useful in, in providing that in, information. And it can also allow you to, to play around um, with operational changes, changing pumps, you know, looking at different logical control strip, um, control rules um, to operate them all. Um, 
So these pictures um, are taken from an operational ca uh, catchment in the United States, South Bend, Indiana. Um, and this has had a, a smart sewer network deployed there for, for over 10 years. Um, and and the, the sole purpose at the beginning of the, the project was, was to reduce those spills um, into the St. Joseph River um, by using uh, existing capacity in the network. So um, there's an intercept sewer that runs alongside um, the banks of the, the St. Joseph River, which is key to this project. Um, uh, but it was spilling to a degree that the US EPA had basically said that um, they needed to, to reduce the spills and the first sort of calculations of how much it would cost to, to build the way out of trouble by, by creating additional storage was going to cost in today's terms about a billion dollars. So South Bend decided they wanted to, to look around and see if there was a, a, a smarter way to do this. So, understanding the network is key, um, and I think understanding the network um, by looking at whole like CSV uh, files is never going to be easy for me, but putting up the data in some type of format um, in a platform that, that helps you understand very quickly, visually, what's going on, I think is key for this kind of operational platform. So, this here is a um, a uh, graphic of the of the uh, intercept sewer as previously described. So it comes from the same project I was just talking about. Um, there are a number of gate valves that are that can be operated using logical controls. They've got PLCs programmed um, uh, to operate depending on what's going on in the network. And those are these uh, circles. So those are the the gate valves that are controlled by logical controls. Um, okay, so. The black fill in these logical control, these sorry, these um, gate valves is percentage closed. The rectangles um, are overflow weirs. So if the level is higher than the crest, which is represented by that black line, goes halfway across the uh, the rectangle, um, that means there's a CSS spill occurring, and the level becomes pink. Um, and the dark conduits have no data being collected within them. Okay, so you see very clearly. Um, in some locations, even though the, the levels are dropping, um, in some locations they never really drop back down um, to, to the expected level. So you see everything's dropping nicely here. Things are not dropping so much in this location. A good visual um, representation of that intercept sewer. So the way in which the rules are derived for the holistic control of a network is, is uses what we call market-based optimization. Um, and what this means is the rules are derived to follow cost curves. So the cost of flow being stored in one location is dependent on what's happening in the network as a whole. So if one of the sensor, the data sensors records the level which indicates um, in this example that there's a problem. Um, so this one's saying CSO30 is about to spill needs to happen and um, data from all the other sensors can then be consulted um, in a decision about what the cheapest solution is made. Okay so that CSO is about to spill what are the options in terms of operating the network to um, help that CSO out and these are the options that are being proffered and you can see that the cheapest option here is this storage tank because that storage tank isn't that full at the minute. So what happens? A deal is done. So this is all being done in real time. So all of the data that is used to um, inform about network operation, which is historic data, et cetera, et cetera, hydraulic models, if, if appropriate, um, they're not run in real time. What, what they're used for is to develop these logical controls that are then um, programmed into the assets that, that can be controlled. Um, and they are then um, just uh, moved or, or changed, controlled, depending on that network uh, of data. Okay, so what did this mean um, to South Bend? Well, as you can see, uh, the project actually was conceived back in 2004. It wasn't until 2008, 2009 
that um, the, the monitoring um, started to be deployed um, across the network. And right away, you can see that there's a drop in these overflow volumes. So these dark blue bars are the um, overflow volumes per year. Um, you can see as time has gone by, the, the volume of overflows has dropped, which has coincided with a, a general trend of rainfall. Um, so that would indicate that, that something good is happening in the operation of that network. But what's happened here is um, just by putting those sensors out, um, the, the operators have been able to look at the, the data anomalies and see that in some locations, as I showed on that previous slide, um, that even when the, the level of water is dropping in a lot of places, it doesn't seem to be dropping everywhere. What it indicated by further investigation into the data is that there were some uh, blockages in the network, some or some sediment buildup. So they went out and investigated those, and straight away, by clearing away those blockages, they were able to, to release some capacity in the network, which then obviously helped with that reduction in CSO spills. Um, but going forward, um, they then started, from the time of that data being out there, they then started to develop those um, market-based optimizations um, and deploy um, gates that could be moved depending on the, the sensor network over time. So um, that has, has been, that wasn't all done in one go, that's been done in swathes of, um, of deployment. And as you can see, that, that trend has carried on to going down. Um, so the platform really helped reduce CSO spill volumes by 75%. So it didn't completely solve the problem, the 100% target. Um, but it did reduce um, the problem problematic spills by 75 percent and that in turn had a knock-on effect of reducing the E. coli um, concentrations in the river by 55 percent. Um, and the financial impact, given that I mentioned earlier that there was a one billion dollar price tag on, on building the, the, the required storage to, to reduce this by 100 percent, spills by 100 um, percent, th this actually has saved them, you know, half of that, that that bill by implementing this. So, as I said, there's still some spillage um, that hasn't been accounted for. So this this was part of, um, phase one of the project with South Bend. It wasn't the only part of phase one. So phase one also had some strategic sewer separation, um, with taking um, combined sewers and, and separating them out. And it also um, involved some um, upgrades to plant capacity. So being able to treat more of the water rather than this spilling. So it was part of that first phase. But at the end of that, as I said, there's still there was still 25% um, CSO spills uh, occurring. So phase two um, has been looking at what needs to be done to, you know, to, to contain that water or attenuate it, manage it in some way. So um, the tools that, that Xylem have um, to do the sort of genetic algorithm um, search on uh, optimization of, of storage and looking at um, the, the most uh, cost effective uh, way of meeting the required storage limits. Um, and that includes spatial and you know where they should be located as well as, as how big they should be, has come up with um, four storage tanks and an abundance of green infrastructure. So that green infrastructure will allow water to be taken out of the, um, you know, not actually entering into the system, but also attenuating it as well. So that takes me to the end of the sewer network presentation. The second part um, that I was going to talk about was about when the flow arrives at the plant. Now, what I've talked about so far with regards to network management has, has talked about reducing CSOs, but one of the other things that the um, platform can be used to do is to look at smoothing flow to treatment. So um, managing the flows so that the peaks can be taken off the, the flow coming to treatment. Um, so using predictive rainfall to inform on any management strategy if there's a storm forecast mm -hmm. um, being able to make sure that there's enough capacity to, to accommodate it in the network. Um, but I think it's, it's key to note that management uh, um, a flow to treatment isn't limited just to the quantity of water, but also needs to, to ensure that any flow that's been stored in the network 
is a, is not going to be harmful to the to the bugs in the in the treatment work. So having um, data some data streams that record the septicity or the dissolved oxygen content of that that um, sewage is also something that that can be built into a platform like this. So making sure that mixing um, septic flow in with other um, the flow to make sure it's a, a very much diluted before it reaches a sewage treatment works is, is key to this kind of management. Um, so what can we do when it arrives at the, at the plant? Well again we use data to learn from the past um, and to use this to make better treatment decisions possible. Um, so the work that we do in networks the first step is to optimising a given process is to look at what data is being measured and what it tells us about the current way the plant is being operated. So this will immediately give us insight as to how efficient it currently is and the scope to improve that efficiency. So it may be that it's inefficient if we're looking at, um, for example, uh, the activated sludge process. It's a very, very common process that people want to um, uh, optimise because over 50% of the energy consumption at a plant will be likely to be used in the activated sludge, sludge uh, process. So um, to provide a good prediction, so this is observed against predicted of what, um, how that, that treatment process, you know, how that's affecting the effluent. So once you've got that model trained, you can then start to read the influent information, know what targets you need to hit as the effluent and then run through hundreds of thousands of different um, treatment uh, options if you like, so different set points, different um, blur intensities, what, whatever the process is that you're looking at, um, in a matter of seconds and come up with the optimum solution, the most efficient but meeting those strict criteria for effluent quality. Um, so Quite frequently, when we deploy one of these platforms in, in the beginning, it will be used in guidance mode. So that means it's just telling the operator how to how to operate the plant. So, you know, these experienced operators, which are are becoming rarer and rarer, um, you know, they'll be able to say, well, that looks like a perfectly sensible way of, of operating the plant, uh, and then they will, um, you know, follow the guidance. And once they're comfortable with with the guidance that's being given, they can then um, switch it over to automatic mode and it will it will automatically make those adjustments to the, the operation of the plant. What is very key for anything like this is that there's extensive QA QC on that data so any um, issues related to sensors so including drift, missing data, spurious data will be flagged immediately to operators um, to ensure that that the, the operation isn't being carried out in faulty or missing data and there will be um, you know very clear um, fallback uh, operational strategies that can be put in place to make sure that you, it's never going to go rogue on you. That's, that's extremely key with this kind of uh, uh, this kind of uh, platform. So finally just to give you a little bit of a, an idea of, of what this looks like and this is an example um, from a case study um, where showing how the energy peaks were removed from an um, activated search uh, process. Um, you can see that there's been periods where the, the, the specific, specific energy has, has peaked and actually after it's been optimised you can see it's much smoother and it's chopped all those big high peaks right out. Um, and, and in this particular case, it, it led to a 20% reduction in the energy usage across that, that process, which is fairly substantial. Now is the time that I ask if there are any questions, but I assume that um, if you're listening to this record version, I, I have not been able to access the platform. So I am not sure whether that means I will be able to speak and answer any questions. Um, so if I can then excellent, I look forward to, to responding to your questions. If not, then I'm more than happy to 
um, be contacted after the event. That's my email address and that's my phone number. So feel free to get in contact. Um, we do also have a booth um, at this conference and I will be in and out of that booth uh, as will my colleagues. So if you do want to come speak to anybody at, at Asylum about anything I've talked about or, or anything else, then please do just pop by. It would be delightful to see you. So all that remains is for me to say thank you very much for your time. I hope you uh, found that uh, interesting. And um, I look forward to, to questions either now or, or later. Thank you. So thanks very much indeed, uh, Ruth. Yeah, you were correct in terms of questions. They, they will have to wait, as I mentioned earlier on. Uh, but uh, thanks once again. That was a, a fascinating presentation with some, with some great case studies. Uh, and thank you to all of, those, all of you who've uh, attended. Uh, the next technical sessions are as shown on uh, the screen. So um, we look forward to seeing you at, uh, at those sessions too. So thanks everyone and uh, goodbye for now.